Five, four, three, two, one, and then zero is live. There's an echo. Welcome, everybody. We're going to discuss quantum space, so here's the echo. My name is Victoria Vesna. I'm the director of the Art Science Center, and I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. James Jimjewski, who is the scientific director and here in quantum space with you. Welcome, Jim. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm going to give a talk about some aspects of quantum mechanics and often uh, most people are kind of uh, put off by the, even the word quantum mechanics because it implies something really, some un understandable physics and equations and so on. But I'll try to make it simple for you. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, open the PowerPoint. I just need to share the screen here with you. Um, okay. Okay, can you see the screen? Okay. Yes. Okay. So my talk is called uh, Music in Quantum Mechanics. And to do with music, there are two people that have a lot to do with quantum uh, phenomena, or did. And one of them is uh, Erwin Schrodinger, who's uh, shown here. And I'll talk about his interpretation in a way of uh, quantum mechanics in terms of musical theory. And over here we have uh, Richard Feynman. He's, uh, he was a Caltech Nobel Prize winner. And he came up with uh, things like the Feynman diagram that you see in the middle. But one of his hobbies was uh, playing the drums. And I'm going to talk about drums in relationship to quantum mechanics. So over the years, um, there have been many different theories around the concept of atoms. Um, in the fifth century BC, Democritus, a Greek philosopher, um, he proposed that matter was made of small indivisible pieces, and he called that atomos, the Greek word for indivisible. So that was way back. And since then, a number of theories have come up for atoms involving their constituent components, which are electrons, protons, and neutrons. For instance, this is called the plum pudding model. It was a, an erroneous model of an atom, but it was getting there. And it wasn't until 1924 we had the kind of idea of uh, quantization. And in between, there were all sorts of crazy things like um, the alchemists who dominated for hundreds of years. They believed you could change one element into another, uh, transmutation. Um, they're actually right because we can now convert one element into another. Anyway, let's go to the end of the 19th century. And at that time, there were very powerful theories about um, things to do with energy and uh, particles. Newton, he had the equations of motion, which were very deterministic um, and allowed you to predict things. And you could look at the past and predict the future, essentially, from Newton's equations of motion. And in terms of light, uh, James Clerk Maxwell had um, theories of uh, electromagnetic magnetism, which were very elegant. So around the end of the 19th century, people believed that the only thing to be done is to add new decimal places to future measurements and discoveries would be made in the sixth place of the decimal. But they were in for a big surprise because a number of observations I won't go into, but they, um, they indicated there was something fundamentally wrong with our theories when we applied it to the very small scale of uh, molecules and atoms. So let me talk about waves, and I'm not gonna talk about quantum mechanics yet, I don't need to. Um, there are different types of waves. You can have sort of water waves, everybody knows that. 
Um, sound waves are fluctuations in the density of air. Everyone sort of knows that. And then we have light, which have uh, electric and magnetic fields. And there's even chemical waves where there's concentration gradients changing in, the, in a test tube, for instance. Um, if we take size of waves, sound, for instance, if we take um, one kilohertz tone, um, which you see something like that, um, it has um, a wavelength of about a foot, about, I guess it's about 30 centimeters or something, or 25 centimeters. Um, and then if you go to very low frequencies, like 20 hertz, 20 times a second, the oscillation, like a very low base, it's about 17 meters. And then if you go up to 20 kilohertz, which is just the limit of hearing, it's only um, about 17 millimeters. Anyway, when you come to light waves, they're of course much shorter. They're in the range of uh, a billionth of a meter, okay? Um, waves can do different things. And what I show here is a picture of two uh, fishermen and they've um, probably fly fishing and they've um, dropped their, uh, their uh, hook into the water and you can see they've generated these wave patterns. So we say monochromatic because um, the wavelength of both of these waves is about the same. And you can see these patterns and I think everyone um, has seen them. Maybe you've been throwing stones into a lake or something and observing it as a child. Anyway, that's a superposition of waves and you see these patterns, you would call them diffraction patterns. And they're actually used in science and crystallography with x-rays to get details on atomic configurations, this uh, diffraction process. Now, in terms of waves, there are other interesting waves. Um, uh, and this, uh, this was brought, up and brought to me by uh, Sir Michael Berry when I was in Bristol as a visiting professor. Um, and that's to do with the idea of a, a solitary wave. And a soliton is a kind of solitary wave. And what you can see here is this is the river Bohr. Um, this is the, the Bohr, sorry. It's um, a solitary wave here um, that occurs typically around about full moon or so. Uh, and I actually have observed one of these. It's very interesting. And this one here is uh, created in Harriet Watt University because actually a Scottish naval engineer um, was on his horse and he saw this uh, solitary wave and he followed it for many miles. Um, and so it's been recreated here in, a, in an aqueduct round about Edinburgh. Okay. Um, actually I have got my slides. Let me just do something here. I'll stop the share and I'll share it again, sorry. Um, okay, is that okay now? Okay, sorry, I was in the presenter view. Anyway, solitons, solitary waves. And actually these uh, solitons are something that's actually uh, used in physics, but to do with uh, light and communication. Okay, so very briefly, this is a kind of basics of waves. What, what are they characterized by? Well, they're characterized by a distance here. It's called lambda in Greek, and that's called the wavelength, okay, from peak to peak. Um, and it's also characterized by how fast it goes up and down. That's the frequency, which is called nu. And of course, how big the wave is, and that's its uh, amplitude. So we can characterize waves in that way. There's also a thing to do with phases. And you can have two types of uh, waves. So you can have a wave that propagates through space. These are propagating waves, okay? Or you can have a situation where you have a standing wave, meaning that there's something fixing it at both ends. 
nodes. And an example of that is, um, is a guitar. And I have a guitar here. Oh. I don't know how the sound will be, but this uh, bottom fundamental, the fundamental uh, tone. But if I go halfway up or the guitar here and hold the string, I get higher frequency, and that's called the second harmonic, is the equivalent of touching along here gently and then removing the finger and the second harmonic exists. And then we can make other harmonics like this, that would be the third harmonic and the fourth harmonic and so on. A real guitar note contains small amounts of different harmonics which give it um, its characteristic sound. Just like a trumpet sounds different from a guitar. Okay, so, um, that's the fundamental things about a guitar. And so, first harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic, you divide the string up into uh, three, there's different nodes here. And that wave is uh, much higher in frequency, obviously, as we heard. So the things we talk about with waves are nodes and antinodes. So the amplitude here is higher, and here the string is effectively not moving. And this is uh, just uh, a simple illustration photograph of that, of somebody vibrating on a string. You can do it at home if you want. Okay, so waves can also differ in uh, what we call a phase. So if we take two waves, you can see they're both in together here in phase, and we bring them together at the same frequency, we can increase the intensity, and that's called constructive interference. Or if we bring waves together such that the trough and the peak are adjacent here, this amplitude cancels with this amplitude and we get um, no intensity. And if the frequencies are slightly different, like here, you can get a thing called beat patterns, so the, the wave increases and decreases um, with time, okay? And uh, another example here um, of using this destructive interference is when you use uh, headphones with active noise cancellation. Effectively, they take this signal and sh phase shift it by 180 degrees and pump it out into the earphones so the background noise then is eliminated. Okay. And sorry, that was a kilohertz signal, um, which corresponds to wavelength about this. Okay. Now the wave patterns um, have been studied by a lot of people. And these are what we call like standing wave patterns, essentially. The first person to the, the you know, became famous for this was called Schla Schladny in, in Italy in 18, uh, 1787. And when he put um, some sand, for instance, on the back of guitar and played, uh, uh, sorry, a violin, and he played um, different tones here, there was more amplitude here, and these are like nodal areas, okay? And the sand tends to move from this area, high excitation, to where the guitar, uh, the, the violin is um, hardly moving. And so these are very interesting patterns that are formed. And we'll be using this concept of standing wave patterns. Another one was Hans Jenny in Switzerland. And uh, he found that when he put uh, sound waves into things like powders, liquids, uh, pastes, and so on. He got these patterns, many different types of patterns. This is just one example, um, which somehow look like very much like nature patterns or things you find in architecture. And that is another example of a kind of standing wave pattern set up. So to summarize, and if you're interested please have a look at this, uh, this particular blog. It's excellent on sound waves. Uh, 
fundamental waves. This is in a single dimension. And we have these um, different harmonics, which have different amounts of nodes and anti-nodes. And these are solutions to when you hit the string, essentially. Well, what happens if we uh, think about a drum? And here's Richard Feynman. He loved playing bongo drums, amongst many other things in his colorful life. Um, when we take a drum, we also can um, excite uh, different types of modes. So for instance, if I hit the drum in the middle or hit it on the edge, you can generate different types of modes. And uh, I think I have, ooh, I don't quite have a drum, but I have a hang drum. And depending on where you hit the hang drum, um, even on one of these, uh, particular flat surfaces, you can generate different types of sound. So this is very much just like the guitar, but it's in two dimensions. And you can see there are different types of modes. So some of these are kind of symmetric, right? If you look at this one and this one, it's symmetric. It's got a zero. And now it's got another number. We have to use two numbers for the drum because it's two dimensional. But you can see there's other modes if you hit it on the edge, for instance, you can, uh, uh, you can generate a different type of tonality. It's more complicated than simple harmonics, but nevertheless, you can generate um, modes here that are quite different from a symmetric mode. If you take a square drum, you can also generate these different modes. And these are simulated, obviously, um, which comes, be, comes to the quantum mechanics part. So in terms of quantum mechanics, what Schrodinger did was he essentially used a kind of musical theory that we've been talking about with the harmonics to um, predict energy levels, which is very important and also even the distribution of wave functions, as we'll see. So don't be put off yet. But just imagine this is a, this is a box, okay? In terms of the guitar, you could imagine this would be two nodes, okay? And now rather than have a string in here, we drop an electron in. And when we do that solution, a solution that very much like the music, right? Sorry we come up with this. This is the solution of the energy levels. And this is what we call the wave function, okay? It just looks like the uh, mode of the way the guitar string is operating. And there's some mass down here, but it's pretty simple. Don't worry about it. It describes the wave function and in terms of one thing, N here. Now, N is not what we're gonna call the first thing, third harmonic. N is just gonna be, simply a quantum number, n. So n equals one, two, three, four. So this is uh, n equals one, two, three, and so on. Now, in terms of the um, probability, you see that the probability is very low here of, um, of actually the amplitude. And that's what we're gonna call the electron probability. And if we square this, you can see that most of the time, most of the energy here in the fundamental mode is in the, the middle, as you would expect. And then when you go to the first harmonic, it tends to be here and here, and the third harmonic here, here, and here. And really, that is a, a thing called the particle in a box, which is something that you know university students learn in the first year or so, or maybe even at high school, depending. Now, the interesting thing is when we do this, it doesn't work exactly like a classical regime because if we put a particle in a box, it would fall to the bottom, right? Maybe it would bounce and then it would end up down here at zero. But the uh, particle in a box, when you do the solution, you see that it doesn't hit the bottom. So it has some energy, if you like, even if the temperature was zero, 
and I mean by really cold, okay? Um, and that is called, uh, that's a, a phenomenon called zero point energy. And the zero point energy is something quite contentious in a way. Uh, there are many effects things called casimir forces and so on but anyway it, re it refers to a random quantum fluctuation of uh, the electromagnetic field okay and it's present everywhere in even a vacuum so if you were to go into space um you think there's nothing there but in many interpretations you can think it's a cauldron of energy and things are coming out and into existence very fast, or virtual existence, even if you like. Okay, so that's the fundamental difference between the guitar string and the uh, and the electron in a box. Now, are there examples of this? And I've got a few. These are not by me. I I, I don't have the uh, the reference, but anyway, um, if you take a, a very simple, small chain of, uh, in this case, palladium atoms. There's only 20 of them in this chain. And this is done by a thing called a scanning tunneling microscope, I might mention at the end, but don't worry about that. If we actually look at the uh, electron probability, it's like probing inside the particle in a box. Voila, what do you see? You can see, just like we saw in the, previous figure there, have a look here, okay? You can see this particle in a box phenomena. So we have nodes, we have anti-nodes here, and you can think of this as the wave function. You would call it the fundamental in music, but we call it the n equals one quantum number, two, three, four. So it's precisely like a guitar. In, if, when we deal with this uh, linear thing. Um, and really, if you were to be asked to explain quantum mechanics and how energy is quantized in a, in, in, for an electron in a box, just pull out a guitar and you can give them a song. This is by uh, Fujita in Japan. It's a very nice example of uh, um, generating this kind of particle in a box. Okay, and this is a scan, these are atoms, and he's deposited an atom here. And now he'll deposit another atom, and they're about nine billionth of a meter from this point to this point. And when he looks at that, and he's probing the electron energy levels, and he's changing the energy, you can see at certain points there are solutions, which I'll show you in the next slide, and it'll be easier to see, but these are equivalently like an electron in a box. So you can see here, he's changed the energy and so on, and you can see this would be the fundamental. This is the first harmonic and second harmonic, but you might think, wait a minute, you know, this thing is, is curved here, what's going on? Well, the point is that the particle in a box or the guitar string, okay, it's, is really rigid and fixed. And when you make a, a particle in a box, you assume that the box goes on forever. But in actual fact, um, the kind of box he made with uh, atoms here is a leaky box. And so if we try to apply that square, particle in a box, you see there's this stuff here, it doesn't, you can see the stuff here doesn't fit in. So rather, he uses a thing called a parabolic potential. So with those two atoms, he's generated a parabolic um, kind of box, okay? And it's a, it, both of those are beautiful examples where recently we can actually physically do measurements to observe such quantum phenomena. Okay, so back to the drums. So what happens if you put an electron in a, a potential that was a two dimensional one? Well, would the same happen? And the answer is yes. So what you see here 
or it's very similar to the drumming, um, drumming kind of modes that we saw, okay? This is the fundamental. This would be the first harmonic type thing. However, you also have these um, sort of oscillate and anti, anti symmetric modes or none that are here. And we can assign a quantum number one, would be like fundamental, two, which would be the first harmonic, and so on. That would be the, the uh, first uh, quantum number. But because of the, there are more degrees of freedom here, we need to add something. And when it's the symmetric way, we call it S, okay? Um, that's the harmonics type thing. But when it's this uh, anti sort of symmetric motion, we call it P. And we have S, P, and D, and that's the second quantum number, okay? To, now, it's two dimensional, um, but the, the, the basic principle was used to understand quantization of electrons in an atom. And this is the de Broglie had a, this is a very simple model here where the electron goes around in a circle. We know that's not really where it goes, but his um, idea for quantization was that this wave should uh, go around and there shouldn't be any discontinuities. And that would be a solution. And indeed it worked out somewhat reasonably. So we have to know, this is Schrodinger. What Schrodinger did was he used the same kind of idea um, as these drums, but if you imagine he made a three-dimensional drum, so you, you have to imagine the kind of sphere moving around and somehow the density, the probability of the electron is changing. And so when you do that, I cannot represent it. It'd be nice to be able to represent it. Um, you can think about um, the probabilities as the basically the square of the wave function in a way. And then you end up with this kind of fuzzy looking atom. This would be a molecule, like maybe hydrogen and hydrogen or something like that. And so we have the nucleus, which is mi minuscule, you can't see it. And then we have these electron probabilities. And the strange thing is um, in quantum mechanics, actually, this wave function doesn't end. It goes on forever, really. You know, it could go to the end, it can go all through the universe. And there is a certain kind of connection between things, um, which uh, is very hard for many people to grasp and hard for anyone to grasp, actually. It's, it's more like a kind of philosophical Buddhistic thing that, that is connected, in, in my opinion. And Schrodinger was very interested by, um, by some of these uh, Eastern philosophies, by the way. Okay, so this would be hydrogen, right? Here we have a proton, here we have an electron. No, it doesn't go around. We can describe it not in terms of some mechanical thing like Newton, but we can describe it in terms of this wave, quantum wave theory. And it resembles very much the guitar string or the drum, some musical instrument in a way. It's very beautiful. And that results in a, a probability only. It's not, we cannot locate that electron at a given time. So I'm gonna go over this quite fast now, um, but because it's maybe too complicated for some people, but basically um, these, these are representations of different, um, what we call orbitals, the wave functions and things of atoms. And it's the probability that 90% of the time the electron will be in this area. And you see these, um, we have these um, different types of nodes because you have radial nodes, okay, in addition to the, it's not like a one dimensional atom. Okay? And you can see the size changes and the number in nodes change, but it somewhat resembles in a, in a way, the simple guitar string, but we've translated it into three dimensions. And that is an excellent way to describe um, electrons in an atom. Now, as we go higher up with the quantum number, we eventually have to introduce, we have other quantum numbers, but I'm not gonna talk about them, but these are important ones. 
So you can have uh, P, but the P number, you know, this is kind of not just nice and symmetric, um, can actually subdivide into three different um, orbitals which are situated along these axes. And it's a kind of way to look at things. It's important maybe when you consider how atoms bind together and so on. But these are like, again, musical kind of, musical three-dimensional kind of solutions in a way. And we can even get D, so go SPD, and then you have five projections, okay? And it has to do with an angular, thing called angular momentum, but we're not gonna discuss that. And they can form all sorts of lovely shapes. Now, when we come to the hydrogen atom, you can see as we go up here for the quantum number, the principal one, the atom becomes bigger and bigger and more diffuse. And if we actually excite the electron in a hydrogen atom way out, we can make actually the hydrogen atom pretty big, you know? Um, so that's something to remember. Now, what else uh, do we have some, some analogy that we can um, associate with uh, vibrating things like strings? So if we take um, a weight, and we take a helical spring here, you know that if you pull it down, it will go back and forward, okay? Um, and we can describe that in terms of uh, here, a potential. So when the, uh, when the position is X naught, that is the position where, let me try and get that position. That's the position where it's moving the fastest, okay? It's got most energy. At that point, its um, kinetic energy is very high, but this is the potential energy, and it's very low. And the total energy is the potential energy plus the kinetic energy, okay? So this is um, a diagram. Now, when we do a molecular vibration, again, like um, previous examples, we had this uh, quantization. And so if we were to vibrate this and move it into, let's say it's first, from its fundamental to its um, harmonic, first harmonic, then we would have to put in some energy, like the heat to move it up here, but it wouldn't move up continuously. It would move up gradually. It, sorry, it would move up in quantum steps. And in fact, it said at the beginning when uh, everybody thought, we know all the physics with Newton and Maxwell. It was actually the fact that this happens, this quantization happens, um, that introduced the concept, of, albeit they weren't too happy about it, um, the, quant the concept of uh, these quantum states. Okay. So this is just... Um, kind of summary of what we've been learning about. So the particle in the box resembling the guitar. And then, you know, this is the Broglie idea, the atoms, you have to fit in um, an exact number. There has to be a phase match so you can get a solution to what goes on with the electrons inside atoms. So there's many things I haven't discussed in this uh, um, talk so far. One of them is called the double slit experiment. And basically, if we take just particles and we put them through slits, okay, um, you would expect to just get a projection of the slit. Um, however, because the electrons have this wave characteristic, and the thing is, does the electron have a wave or does the wave have the electron? No, we don't know, but there's a, at least in the standard Copenhagen interpretation, there's um, a series of interferences going on. You remember the interference you saw with the, the two fishermen? Well, some, well, in this case, even though it's one electron, one electron somehow, because it's wave-like, thinks it could go through both slits and generate uh, some pattern of the detector here. There's also an alternative explanation by Bohm that I like, but um, not very well accepted, or it's becoming interesting. So how can you see quantization? Well, if you have um, a new television with the quantum, quantum dot display, you're actually 
staring at quantum mechanics every day when you watch the news in the sense that the colors that are used are generated by things called quantum dots. And all of, this, all of these materials here are exactly as the same material. So it's not a different pigment, a different chemistry. It's just that the size of the particle has changed. And we find that the smaller, this is going to small here, this is like maybe two nanometers or two billionths of a meter. And we move up here to bigger, like 10 units. You can see you can change the color. So you can make a whole spectrum of colors. And that has to do essentially what the similar effect that we've been discussing with the guitar string. Like when you make this smaller, you change in energy levels and so on. And if you change energy levels, you change wavelength, if you change wavelength, you change the color. Um, there are another couple of examples um, that are kind of interesting, that are very relevant to uh, a lot of um, interesting science that goes on in nanotechnology and so on. And that is the quantum tunneling. What is quantum tunneling? Well, if you take something like, um, you imagine the idea of this electron here has associated with a, a wavelength. And as it comes to this uh, barrier, this would be like a part of the, the, the particle in the box. This would be like part of the box here. Well, it's not infinitely high. Then it can be, a wave would be reflected. Okay, so it can go reflected. However, there's a probability that the wave, this um, barrier, this wall is very thin that it can travel through. And that process is called quantum tunneling. And it's actually the basis of an invention by Binnig and Rohrer way back in 83. They got the Nobel Prize for it in 1986, um, where using this tunneling effect, we can use a very short metallic tip and tunnel through a barrier here and actually look at atoms and molecules. Um, and the machine sometimes can look complicated like this thing here. This happens to be one that's at the California Nanosystems Institute. But you know, it's like quantum mechanics. Actually, all of this stuff can be reduced to this part, which is a very, very sharp atomic tip in a surface. And uh, using that, there were some lovely observations more to do with the waves, right? Um, so Don Eigler, IBM, Al Almaden, and co-workers, he um, actually moved around, in this case, iron atoms on a copper surface. He made um, an elliptical shape, let me see, an elliptical. And if you take an ellipse, unlike a circle, it's two, um, there are two points here that are, if you like, the center of the circle. And when he looked at it, he could see that these electrons, these are um, electron like probability, if you like, they actually form these fantastic patterns and you can mathematically work out what they are. And they're essentially standing waves. So you remember the two guys fishing? Um, well, this is, a, this is a, an electron analogy of sort of looking in, in a way of a lake or something where there's some um, rocks dropping in. It's very beautiful work. And each one of these is uh, an iron atom. Um, and when I came to UCLA in 2001, uh, grad student wanted to do something. And so after a couple of years, at low temperature, we, she managed to make UCLA, still the smallest UCLA logo in the world. Everybody's made these logos, I guess, that has a fancy microscope. But what you can see, and in addition to these copper, uh, sorry, the carbon monoxide atoms, you can see these fantastic patterns, and they're essentially interference patterns of, uh, of standing electron waves, if you like. Okay. Other stuff I'm going to not discuss, but is um, things like uncertainty. <laughs> you know, the, there is a problem that if you try to measure the position of this electron, which is a bit crazy, right? You can't measure some other phenomena. And um, that's called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And you've all probably heard of the uncertainty 
equity principle. Um, I'll finish off with um, something that really inspired me from a number of years ago. Um, Not the music, but he found that, for instance, you can get waves in chemical reactions, even on surfaces. And in this case, he took the carbon monoxide that we experienced and oxygen on a platinum surface. And what happens is the carbon monoxide is pretty simple. But in the process, there's a number of complicated things going on here. You actually get was actually at the event and they gave me um, as a memento um, a VHS tape of the performance. Now I haven't been able to see that anywhere on the web, but Oh, okay, no problem. Well, let me just stop the share. Okay. Well, what I was saying was that Ertl, Gerd Ertl is a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, and he studied these oscillating chemical reactions of carbon monoxide plus oxygen making carbon dioxide, okay? Sounds simple on platinum, which is a catalyst, but it generates these beautiful wave patterns and when I was at the Fritz Haber Institute in uh, Berlin, I was invited to a party for him and they played this uh, music, it was fantastic. Um, okay, so I think that's um, basically the end of my talk. And I actually hear there's a famous, uh, famous uh, microscopist somewhere in the audience there by the name of Franz Giesebel. And he is one of the leading researchers, actually, in uh, being able to look at tiny forces, and tiny atoms, and, and see magnificent physics. And if it wasn't for quantum mechanics, um, he would have to do something else. Anyway, he's also interested in sound. So that's my, and that's my talk. And the idea is quantum mechanics is not that complicated. Um, if you just think about things like uh, the guitar and sound waves, it's a good, it's a good, it's a, it's a good way to sort of wrap your head around it. Um,